Welcome to round number two of the 1966 Formula One World Championship, deep in the Ardennes at the legendary Spa Frankershamp for the Belgian Grand Prix. This is the second points paying F1 race of 1966 in part 22 of my 1966 series where I take on the role of Richie Axelson, our intrepid racing driver, and race through a full season as they did back then, driving anything and everything and everywhere possible. Our driver Richie is coming off a podium, third place at round one in Monaco. Somewhat of a surprise driving a smaller engine car, we muscled our way around tight battles with Lorenzo Bandini and Jim Clark, the circuit's nature in Monte Carlo minimizing the disparity in performance of our aging engine. But the strict confines of city streets have given way to the wide open spaces in the rural Belgian countryside. The Grand Prix Circus has headed north for its annual and eagerly anticipated visit to one of the most legendary circuits in racing history. And for 1966, it was an even bigger build-up than normal. For a promise to be true high-speed racing at the fastest circuit on the calendar, thanks to F1's return to power. The sports cars had just finished their inaugural 1,000km race at the circuit a few weeks before, with the Ferrari 330p3 driven by Mike Park setting a record lap time approaching 140 miles an hour average, beating out the existing F1 record by nearly 2 miles an hour, set in 1964 by Dan Gurney. But it was expected that upon the Grand Prix cars return with their full 3 liter engines, the record would easily come back to the nimble, high powered machines, but how low could it go? During practice qualifying sessions leading up to the event, it was John Surtees driving the sleek V12 powered Ferrari who answered that question and smashed the record by over 5 miles per hour, driving a 3 minute 38 second lap to take the pole. Joachim Rint shocked everyone by putting his V12 Maserati powered Cooper second on the grid. One of the five of its type entered in the race, the Maseratis were well suited for the fast flowing course, Cooper being one of the few manufacturers truly ready for the 3 liter era. Despite testing their H16 engine in practice, the BRM team and Jackie Stewart opted once again for their proven 2 liter V8 for reliability. Perhaps due to some slipstreaming, they were able to muster an impressive third on the grid, but well off the pace of Surtees. And Jack Brabham was once again the only other 3 liter car on the grid, with his now relatively seasoned Repco V8. Despite what should have been a clear advantage, practice issues saw him take only fourth on the grid. The remaining field was filled with a mix of older, bored out smaller engines and chassis. Lotus had planned to take their BRM powered H16, but after endless issues they sided with the factory team's decision and flew back to Britain to collect one of their proven Climax machines. Notably it was Dan Gurney who finally brought his brand new Anglo-American racing machine to the grid. Appropriately dubbed the Eagle, it was paired with a placeholder Climax engine while the team worked on their full displacement option for later in the season. Gurney and team were eager to test the chassis and debut their American entry on the grid, and there was no better place for the sleek machine to run than Spa. And so excitement was at a fever pitch heading into the Grand Prix, but the 1966 Belgian Grand Prix would go down in history as one of the sport's most infamous races. Lining up on the grid, storm clouds brewed in the distance, but finally after delays due to the filming of the MGM movie, the flag was waved and the field rushed up a rouge behind Surtees and into the countryside. Upon reaching the village of Burninville and Malmedy, the rain hit, in torrential bursts surprising the drivers and sending Bonnier, Bondurant, Hill, and Stewart all spinning off the track. Stewart by far took the worst hit, his BRM slamming into a telephone pole near the Masta Kink and coming to a stop as a crumpled wreck. After nearly a half an hour trapped in his destroyed race car and sitting in fuel, Hill and Bondurant were able to pull him from the wreckage. But this accident would leave its mark, not only in Stewart's injuries, but as a spark for Stewart's ambition to make Grand Prix racing safer, pushing him to begin his safety crusade which radically changed the sport throughout the 1970s. But as always, the race continued on, and at the end of the first lap, nine cars which had took the start were missing, with Surtees leading the way over Rint, Bandini, and Brabham. And the order continued much that way, slipping and sliding at dangerous high speed until the completion of 28 laps, with Surtees coming away as the expected winner. This race was immortalized in the Grand Prix 1966 film and certainly helps paint the picture of the legendary venue Spa was. And so we're here to create our own edition of this famous race. Looking at the points after round one, it's Jack Brabham who leads the way over John Surtees with ourselves, Richie Axelson in third with four points after the podium finish. 
Remember, only the top five rounds for each driver will contribute to their final points, so it will be important every step of the way to maximize the points available, and as we get further into the season, it's likely the battle will tighten as each driver's worst performances are dropped. Having finished third last time out in a far less superior machine, I could be happy with where we've placed. And for this round, something new. Just as in real life, Dan Gurney has finally delivered his Eagle T1F chassis for himself and Richie to race. It's a sleek machine, but paired temporarily with the lower-powered Climax 2.7 liter engine, will once again be down on power while the team continues work on a full-size replacement. So in this race as ever, slipstreaming will be key to staying competitive. But if we're lucky and some other teams have trouble, we may be able to squeeze onto that podium once again. And so we'll take a look at the starting grid. John Surtees, as in real life, got the pole in his Ferrari. It's just such a better car at this stage than the rest on the grid. So taking the pole with a 338.22, not too far off the real time, with Jack Brabham alongside in the Brabham V8, and Richie Ginther on the front row as well. Three wide starting grid with Richie Ginther starting uh, ahead of his teammate Jochen Rint, who starts back in fourth with a 42.43. So really tight. Uh, after you get past Surtees, especially between Ginther, Rint, and Stewart. Stewart starting alongside Rint there. Looking further back, the grid continues on from there, and I'm starting all the way back in 11th position with a 337, quite a far ways off the front times, but it's all about that slipstream, and it just wasn't something I could get paired up with a fast car during the practice qualifying session. So starting back on the fourth row next to Denny Holm in the uh, smaller engine, Brabham and Mike Spence, but ahead of a few slower drivers as well, including my teammate, Dan Gurney. So it's going to be important to get off the line, maybe jump a few of these spots, hopefully get up with some of the quicker cars. And I do know that in the slipstream, I should be able to keep up. So as long as I can stay connected to somebody, I can hopefully work my way towards the front. And so taking a look at the circuit, this is the classic 8.769 mile loop through the countryside through Belgium. The start of the lap is the same as the modern Grand Prix course, but as we work our way up through Eau Rouge and to Lacombe, the modern track would veer off to the right where this one continues on through the fast straightaways, through the towns of Burninville, Malmedy, down through the Mastic Kanka, scary chicane where Stuart had his accident, and then to the purpose-built corner of Stavlo, which sends us back towards the start-finish section through Blanchemont and the only slow corner on the course, La Source, to then begin another lap. The real Grand Prix was 28 laps, down from 32 laps the year before, and down, I think, even more from 38 or so laps for many years before that. 28 laps, though, a shorter race. I know that was enjoyed very much by the drivers, at least for this year specifically, since there was so much rain. And keeping with the one-third distance that we're doing for the full season, that means we'll be doing just nine laps around the course, but at over three and a half minutes a lap, it is still quite a long race, but a quicker race maybe than some of the other races are, since it is such a high speed. And also keeping as close as we can to the real event, we'll also be running in adverse weather conditions during the Grand Prix, or as close as we can get in Grand Prix Legends. Grand Prix Legends doesn't actually simulate rain, so we've got some fog condition, a little bit lower surface grip, but all in all just gives a better impression of maybe not such a nice bright sunny day. Certainly nowhere near what the real Grand Prix was, but it should still be a great race. So there's a lot on the line for this one, but this is always one of the most enjoyable races on the Formula One Grand Prix calendar. So let's get started with it. The 1966 Belgian Grand Prix. All right, so here we are towards the back of the grid. A whole bunch of cars in front. Just have a couple to my right there. Three wide start. Flag is up down we're underway oh, we got a very slow roll off the line jim clark blocked me a little bit there shift up the second maybe a bit early as we'll come down towards Eau rouge try to keep it tidy on the inside we got cars all next to me there to so work our way up the hill jim clark's gonna slot in front right against the hay bales on the inside we got joe sifford behind here's clark to the right he's gonna squeeze me out We'll keep it in third though. Slot in behind him. We got Sifford behind. I don't think anybody next to me. So past maybe a couple cars there off the lines. We'll work our way now to Lacombe. It's where the modern circuit dips off to the right. We'll continue on here. Down to third, down to second. Cold tires, full fuel. Alright, try to get a nice run out. So we'll now get onto the fast straightaways. Need every bit of speed that we can in the Eagle. Find our way now towards Burninville. Just see that yellow banner peeking out of the mist in front. 
want to look to the inside, but this would be a really hard place to pass, especially on cold tires. We'll just keep it nice and balanced here, work our way through Burnonville. Nice little string of cars in front. This is where the rain started in the real Grand Prix, coming to Malmedy. Tricky chicane, just lifted the throttle there, turn to the right. Get on through now on the straightaway towards the Masta Kink. Get it up to fifth gear, the slipstream gear. Got Bandini on the right there, kind of slow. He slots in front of Clark. Clark slowed down as well. We're going to be able to pass him. There we go. Nice and easy pass, Jim Clark. the kink down a fourth gear in the opening lap just want to watch out not to run a little bit wide it's so easy to get dragged off the line with the grass Clark's gonna stick right in behind in the slipstream get it up to fifth just for a second here as we'll work our way down to Stavolo entry to Stavolo down to fourth gear to Stavolo itself banked corner only proper racing corner on the track third gear run a bit wide in the middle Clark's right there behind me get the run back towards the start finish then all right so picked up one spot there down towards the Mastic Kink I think everybody got choked up in front Jim Clark got caught out Try not to run wide. Slid the car a little bit there. You can hear the tires yelling. This one's a tighter corner. Lorenzo Bandini running a little wide in front. I think he's got Bonnier in front of him. Now on the straightaway towards Blanchemont. We'll get it back up to fifth just for a second in the slipstream here. Might actually be able to keep it in fourth if we're on our own. You just pick up a lot of speed in the slipstream. You almost need a separate gear for it. Get it down to fourth gear. Sure the car grips up there. Put it into third for Blanchemont. Get through the final couple of corners. Fourth gear, Jim Clark keeping me busy in the mirrors. So try to break. He's going to slip up the outside. I'll take the inside line into the source. Bandini gets around Bonnier. Slot in behind him here as we'll work our way down the hill and complete lap number one. Not such a bad lap and still all the cars right in front. Saw one disappearing very far in the distance at the top of Eau Rouge and Radion. Get on the throttle. Bonnier a little slow. Shift to third kills me though. Engine has a very narrow power band, just right at the high end. Also don't want to over rev it, risk blowing the engine, need to worry about mechanical failures even with a proven engine. Down to second gear. A couple cars behind, I think Spence chasing Jim Clark behind. Runs out a little wide. Be on the outside here, coming up to Burnonville. Almost runs me off the track. Quite an interesting spot to try to pass. Come into Burnonville. Just balance the car, fourth gear. I'm a little inside the line, but better than outside of it. Over the bump there, gonna run a bit wide. Missing the line completely through that section. We'll try to keep it flat through Malmedy. There we go. Get it onto the Masta straight, right on the back of Bonnier now. Up to fifth gear. Oh, Maserati in front pulling away. Even in the slipstream like this, it's just got a lot of power, and this is the fastest part of the track. He's gaining quite a lot. He's got the power for the slipstream from Bandini in front out to the kink. A bit faster than last time. Whoa, we got a car spinning off in front. Is that Stewart? It might have been Jackie Stewart, and that is remarkably close to where that happened in real life, too. 
my god, we saw a car spinning. We're trying to get everything together, come down towards Stavolo. Get it down to third gear, just get the car pointed and try to regain a little bit of concentration. You can't make incidents like that happen in Grand Prix Legends. It's a total coincidence, but... Lost Bonnier through all that a little bit. We'll come up, work our way towards Bon Chemin. Still Jim Clark right behind. Gained a little bit there on him. Definitely pretty good through the corners. I think this car actually will handle quite well at some of the slower tracks, even with this engine, but it's just absolutely outmatched here at Spa. Keeping it in fourth gear right now. Whoa! Bonnier runs a bit wide. I actually have to get on the brakes there to stop from running into him. A very close call. Just a little bit of wheel contact and what happened to Jackie would probably be the same here. Alright, got through there though. Bonnier is holding me up a bit. We've got Bandini in front. Up to the source. Oh, Bonnier leaves the inside open. Get down to first gear and just sneak it in there a little late on the brakes. Just nip the curving on the inside, and he's going to be side by side with Jim Clark behind. So there we go. Take a look at the pit board, but it's going to be a lap delayed. We do have seven laps to go. We were P9 last time through, so maybe P8 now. But with the other cars wrecking, not quite sure. Just concentrate on the lap ahead. We got Bandini right in front, and then a couple more cars not too far up the road. Not sure if we'll be able to catch him, though. Bandini driving the smaller Ferrari, really based on, I think, their Tasman entry in the 1965 car. Not the same machine that Surtees has. Oh, a car almost breaks to the left there. So get it through Lacombe. A little bit on Bandini there. Get it up to fourth gear, coming towards Burninville. A nice run here, but it's a hard place to pass. Can stick it up the inside, though. Back out of it. It's just not, not a good place to do it, especially this early in the race. It's a lot like Monaco, again, chasing Bandini, but a bit easier to pass around Spa if you've got the speed. Come through Malmedy right on his gearbox. run then. He's going to block me to the inside. I had to let off the throttle there. But once again, got to run on the Mazda straight. Side by side. Get it up to fifth gear. He's going to lurch forward. Maybe gearing should have been a little bit different, but really need that fifth gear to help with the slip streaming. Don't want to over the engine for the full race. Down to fourth gear. See if there's any sign of the BRM that went off. It definitely was a BRM. You can see some skid marks there too. It might have been more than one car. It's absolutely the place it would happen. Remarkably close to where it happened in real life. Nice run on Bandini then down towards Stavolo section. He's going to outbreak me though. It's just not confident enough to stick it up the inside. Work it through Stavolo. Fourth gear. Maybe should have gone down to third there. You can see Bonnier behind. He's not too far off. Pulling Bandini back in. They're losing whoever those two cars were in front of him. Disappearing into the fog a bit. A bit wide there. Get a nice line through here. Can pick up a little bit of time on him. All right, nice run on Bandini then. Good place to pass to right before Blanchemont up the inside. Easily clear him. There we go. 
a, it's a nice clean pass. Keep it in four tiers. We enter a couple of corners. Third gear there. A little bit slow, but just trying to make sure I get the line right so he can't get around me. If you get the right line, it's incredibly hard to pass, especially if you get a good exit, but he's right there. Still saw the two cars in front just disappearing a bit. Into fourth just for a second here. You don't really want to waste the RPM shifting, but kind of have to. So come down to the source, trying to tell brake myself, gonna do it a little bit. Just locked up that right front. All right, stay in front of Bandini. We'll look at the pit board again. So we were P6 last lap. These were probably up to P5 then getting around Bandini. So well into the points now, which is good from the starting position. Obviously some attrition in front and not totally out of touch with the two cars in front. So we'll see what we can do here to try to stick with them. No idea who it would be. Pulled out quite a lot on Bandini there through the end of the lap though. Ugh. Finally get a second here. A lot, of, a lot of stuff happened so far in the race. All in all successful so far. Get it down to second gear for Lacombe. Try not to run wide, but want to carry speed where I can. There's a car in front. Two cars. Not sure at all who they would be. Can't imagine it's Surtees unless he's having an issue. Very well could have been Surtees that slid off. I know it was a BRM. To Burninville here, just keep it in fourth gear, lifted the throttle on entry. Get those left tires right on the darker part of the groove. Some skid marks there through Burninville. I don't think those were there last time through, so either a car in front or somebody behind has gone off. We're gonna push a little bit here through Mamadi. Bandini closing up behind me then. In fourth here since we got nobody to slipstream with. He's gonna have a little bit more speed than me as we work it down towards the Master Kink. We'll make him get around though. He backs out of it. It'd be such a hard place to pass. Keep it in fourth here just to lift the throttle on the way in, then back in it. As long as you get the line right, you still see those skid marks there. Every lap they're just gonna haunt you. down the line towards Stavolo. Tentative on the entry there. We'll get it down to third here through the corner. Want to try to accelerate early. Just can't clip. There's a little curb on the inside near that bridge that can upset the car if you cut it just a little too close. Not a bad run there, but Bandini closing up. I take the right line. He's going to have a really tough time getting around. Just can't make a mistake. The two in front, barely visible. I don't know if you'll be able to see him. A little early on the apex there. Going to run right to the edge. Nip the dirt. Just looking in my mirrors. Bandini should have a bit of a run, but probably won't be enough. Hopefully, he's going to stick in behind. He's interested in following me right now, maybe. And nice and tidy here. Just touching the grass on the inside. Up to fourth. Down to the source. Want to be a little less dramatic on the brakes this time through. Ooh, side by side in front is what I want to see. Right. Down to first gear. A little hot still, but much better at slowing it down. Across the line, complete another lap. So two cars still in front. If they can battle with each other, that'll just help so much. Down to second the bottom row rouge it's actually quite easy to spin the car there because it almost bottoms out running a pretty stiff suspension so the car doesn't like that big compression but it's really the only place on the track something like that happens you really need the stiff suspension for all the fast corners the 
last second here. So right with these two in front, I think I'm closer than I was last time through, so losing them in the middle of the lap, but towards the end in the start of the lap, I think I'm quite a bit faster. So Gurney's chassis here proving to be quite a capable little car. I think once we have more power, it'll be a really good one. I can hear Bandini coming up behind. I don't even need to look at the mirror. Not such a bad run through there, but I think he just gets a bit of the slipstream and is just a bit quicker overall, at least in that section of the track. Right at 7,000, need to go up to fifth. Just don't want to blow the engine. Oh, he's looking towards the inside. Just not going to be able to get up close to me. Back down to fourth through Masta. Fifth gear just for a second. Trade spots with him left to right. Not really trying to block, but don't want to let him by easily either. Get down to third gear. Around Stavolo there. Gotta imagine it's maybe the Coopers in front. I can't think that Brabham or Surtees, unless they're having some issues, Bandini going to look to the inside again. I can't imagine I'm going to catch them unless, unless they're having some problems, which is always possible. I can't quite make up the color of the cars. Just need to get closer to them. Concentrate on that. Better run here. Through that right-hander. down towards Blanchemont now. There's a lot of time to think about the corners coming up at Spa, especially if you're not actively in the slipstream with anybody, so you can almost overthink it sometimes, whereas other tracks you just react as the car laps the circuit. This one you can think about what's coming up a lot. Tricky to stay on the limit through some of the sections that just hit the outside there. to the source can hear Bandini closing in oh I took a peek in the mirror is going to run wide again no I'm get back on it he's side by side with me so we'll work our way down the hill there we go still stay in front of him that was almost a big mistake come across the line couldn't quite see it I think it said rent in front just got a quick peek at the pit board there I think it said rent though, should have four laps to go. All right, work it up through Radion. Closing in quite nice now, and I think it could be rent because I'm seeing a green helmet in front, so probably Ginther and rent. And the Maseratis, I'm surprised I can actually keep up with them, but if they're battling with each other, that's probably why. Going to Lacombe, second gear. Slide a bit wide, just keep the momentum up around the outside. There's another skid mark right back there too, so possibly a lot of attrition towards the back. We're not seeing many cars behind, just Bandini there, so no idea what's happened in this race so far, but it's clearly been quite eventful. off the throttle there in the middle of Burnonville's not what you want to do. Got to keep it tight on the exit and through Mamadi. Set up for the Masta straight, which is probably the weakest part of the track for the Eagle. We're going to run a bit wide too. Get onto that access road. Past the fences and the poles and the walls. It's absolutely crazy and this isn't Anything is what it would be like in actual wet conditions, but a little bit of that atmosphere. So enjoyable. Come down to the Mastic Kink. 
fourth gear. You can hear Bandini behind, but he wasn't quite as close as previous laps because I think I've caught the slipstream finally of the two Coopers in front. Definitely Yak and Rint in front of me here. Fifth gear. It's going to help out quite a bit to stay in front of Bandini, but I'll have to figure out how to get around these two. I'm down to Stavolo. in the slipstream. Oh, right on his gearbox. He checked up a bit there. Almost ran into the back of him. That was so close. Bandini's falling quite a bit back. Almost a brake check from Rint there, but just caught it in the nick of time. Raised the heart rate a little bit. Be careful getting close. He's got a nice run here coming up to this right-hander, but it's, that's a tricky place to pass. Have a little bit of time to sort these two out. I don't think I'm going anywhere past them in front. Rent's going to have the slipstream from his teammate in front there, Ginther. Just keep my eyes on the mirror, too. Make sure Bandini's not going to sneak around me. A little space as we come down to Blanchemont. That third gear. I think I've got a higher apex speed, which is going to make it quite tricky to get around because on the straightaways, I'm definitely slower. Break to the left. Might be able to get one of them in the source here. Let's see what we can try up to fourth gear. I broke myself the past couple laps, so I need to be careful about it. Brent breaks to the left. Oh, a slam on the brakes. He's squeezing me on the inside. Bandini right behind, too. A lot happening there. Rear end kicks out. Successfully defended, Rint. All right, three laps to go. P5. Potential podium in front. Don't want to think about it yet. Still a lot of racing to go here. Three laps is a lot around Spa. here run up to Lacombe it's been straightened out these days but nothing straight here to get a pass or a move for a second up to fourth gear then down to third down to second oh really check up on the brakes there Rent's really messing up my rhythm it's just slow in all the wrong spots and quick in others almost swap ends there lost the wheel for a second but luckily kept it out of the guardrails make quick work of these two. Rent's going to run a bit wide there. Need to take advantage of a moment like that. Cut up in front of me as we come into Burninville. Nice and easy. Bandini's falling off just a little bit. I think me sticking with these two are actually quicker even though they're all over the place. I got a nice run on Rint then. Coming up to the Mazda straight. Try to stick around the outside. Should get the slipstream from Ginther here. Rint falls in behind. All right. Still get that run coming on Ginther. Always face to the inside as we come up to the kink. The falling behind him here. Getting around Rint, got Ginther, you can quickly get around him too. Nice run, coming out of the Masta kink. Down towards Stavolo, side by side, wheel to wheel. So scary. So we'll come into Stavolo, just gonna back out of it. It's just not possible, making contact.
I've seen the replay several times now. I don't think I could have done too much different. I was taking a pretty conservative line just to set up Ginther maybe through Stavolo and totally lost track of Rint behind me, but I think he maybe came into me a little bit. I don't think I could have kept it much more tidy through there. We narrowly missed the building to the left and luckily flew into the forest and uh, landed upright. So Axelson and Rint both lucky to get away with that one, but I'm so disappointed. I was so close to getting on the podium. I think it was realistic that I could have gotten on the podium in the Eagle, which is no easy feat around Spa. I was so down on power on the straights and really had to try to make it up in the corners. But for some reason, the two Coopers there were were quite slow. So I think I was going to be able to get around Ginther. But half the battle is finishing the races and I wasn't able to do it. One of the only main Grand Prix I think I've crashed out of. I think the last one was the Italian Grand Prix of 65. So any crash that you can walk away from, maybe just a little bit bruised at Spa, is, uh, is one you can count yourself very lucky from. So very disappointing way to end the Belgian Grand Prix overall, but we'll take a look at the final results. Surprisingly, the world doesn't revolve just around Richie Axelson. The race continued on despite the carnage, and John Surtees, just like in real life, took the win ahead of Jack Brabham, and Jack held on just 10 seconds behind Surtees, so not such a big distance between them, but that Ferrari right now is so powerful, and uh, once Bandini gets one of those two, you gotta watch out for that team for the Constructors' Championship. Lorenzo Bandini, though, even with the smaller powered Ferrari, able to finish in third place, about a minute behind the leaders, but part of that pack that I was a part of, he ended up getting around Ginther, who held on despite the carnage behind him and finished in fourth place. Joe Siffert and his Cooper able to finish in fifth, and then Mike Spence in the Lotus, rounding out the top six. You see my teammate there, Dan Gurney, finishing the race. He'll be very upset about this chassis we just destroyed, uh, but he's finished in seventh position just outside the points, so no points for Eagle in their first Grand Prix. Guy Ligier finishing in eighth, and Denny Holm, the last finisher in ninth place. Just like in real life, we had super high attrition. Both Yak and Rint and myself, the last two out of the race with just about two and a half laps to go, both with an accident. I'm classified behind him. Bob Bondurant finishing back in 12th with an accident as well. One of those that likely went off in some of the skid marks we saw. Joe Bonnier with a suspension issue, so the only one without an accident retiring. Uh, back in 13th, Jim Clark with an accident. Jackie Stewart, who we saw fly off through the Mastic Kink, which is so eerily similar to his real life crash. And then Graham Hill back in 16th with an accident as well to finish this chaotic Belgian Grand Prix. So taking a look at the point standings and an interesting pair up, Jack Brabham and John Surtees effectively tied for the championship. I'm not even sure who would win in the event of a tiebreaker, but both with one win and a second place apiece with 15 points. Tied for first place, similar story now for third place overall with myself, Richie Axelson, and Lorenzo Bandini with just four points apiece and not scoring in the other round. So unfortunately, or I have to hope that Spa ends up being one of the drop races and I, I don't have to end up keeping a zero points finish, but definitely going to be on the list to be a drop race. The championship is still so early on, and with the drop races, there really is a lot of opportunity to improve. But with both Jack Brabham and John Surtees being so strong out of the gate, it's going to be really tough to catch them as we continue on. Jim Clark and Richie Ginther tied for fifth place uh, with three points. Jackie Stewart and Joe Sifford tied for seventh with two points. And Graham Hill and Mike Spence tied with one point apiece for ninth. Similar story in the Constructors' Championship with Brabham Repco and Ferrari tied for first place with 15 points apiece. Same idea as the Drivers' Championship, just translated over to manufacturers. But Brabham Climax still in third place for my finish at Monaco. Uh, no Eagle Climax on the board, unfortunately, from us here. I really thought it could happen because I was in the points so early in the race, but could have had a podium potentially, but could have should have. Uh, not going to collect any more points for Climax and Brabham anyway. I'd have to think it's kind of a building year for Eagle for us to get our feet in, um, but hopefully can score some points later on in the championship. Lotus Climax and Cooper Maserati tied for fourth there. I imagine Cooper's going to jump up the championship as we go, just because they have so many entries right now into the race, but it's only the top scoring car from each chassis engine manufacturer that scores points. Then BRM and then Lotus BRM right at the bottom there with one point from Mike Spence's finish here today. So it wouldn't be racing if it finished on the podium every time, but just to know that it was close on a circuit which really shouldn't have suited the Eagle makes me quite excited for the races coming up. A very similar round 
up next for the World Championship, going to the French Grand Prix at Reims. But that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it. Not the race I wanted to have, but I guess Spa lived up to its reputation with this one. A messy Grand Prix, ending in an accident, in the fog, in the rain. I think I'm happy to be done with this one. So thanks for watching. This is GP Laps. I'll see you all again next time.